morning we start in just a two-part series on the family of God. God brought me this message, or actually, I should say that he had been working on me uh, through bringing uh, his word as it relates to bringing you this message. He had already brought the message to me, so I want to share with you what he shared with me in a two-part series on the family of God. How many of you know what the word adoption means? How many of you know what adoption means? In fact, we have some folks in this church that have adopted or have been adopted. Uh, if you're in here, be proud. Raise your hand. Amen? Yes. So how many of you know who can share with me what the word adoption means? Who can tell me? Who wants to do that this morning? What does the word adoption mean? <laughs> well, don't look at that. Don't look at that word. Come on, it's already up there. Come on, that's cheating. Come on, tell me what it means to you. What does adoption mean to you? We well, you know, we see that to bring into a specific relationship, especially to, to take one's uh, as one's own child. Yes. To take someone who is not related to you and to whom you have no necessary relationship and choose to bring them into relationship with you generally as your child. Wow, that was great. <laughs> wow, you <laughs> chose to do that, right? <laughs> to choose to bring them in relationship with you. <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> Um, to give a child a second chance. To give a child a second chance. Wow, another great definition. Who else had one? I saw hands go up and they all went down. I heard that chocolate line down that you saw. All right. Well, let me tell you, that's, that's a great definition. Listen, I went as well. Here's, listen to this. It says, define the word adoption, the act of accepting with approval, favorable reception, a close affection and protective acceptance, a legal proceeding that creates a parent-child relationship between persons, as you mentioned earlier, that are not related by blood. It's the adoption of a child that entails or entitles that child to all the privileges, all the rights, and all the inheritance as if they were blood-related. <laughs> you agree with me on that? <clears throat> Amen? This morning, I want to talk to you about adoption. And let me ask you this question. I want you to think about this question very closely this morning. How many of you have been adopted? How many of you have been adopted? Now think about the question. How many of you have been adopted? Now let me, let me, ask, you, let me ask you this. If you have been adopted, who have you been adopted by? God. God. How many of you believe that God chose you? Amen. Amen. How many of you believe God gave you a second chance? Well, we've already heard that definition this morning. Amen, church? So this morning, I want to talk to you about adoption. If you will get your Bible, we're going to go to a lot of places this morning. I want you to, to gravitate to this message. I want you to consume this message. And I want you to take some notes this morning. So maybe down the road, you can explain to someone what it means to be adopted into the family of God. If you think about adoption, and let's be honest just for a moment. I've talked to many parents, who have, or many parents, many uh, uh, couples who have said, I want to adopt a child. And they will tell you, if, if they'll be honest with you, they will sit down and they will say to you, listen, I want one that is what, church? Begins with an H first. What are they looking for? A what child? Healthy. healthy child. They want a healthy child. And then what else are they looking for? A what? They want a baby. They don't want one that's 10 or 15 years old. They don't want to have to break the dents of the molds. They don't want one that's already set in its ways. So they're looking for a baby. They're looking for a healthy child. They're looking for a baby, someone that they can craft and mold from the very beginning of life. What else are they looking for? They're looking for a good-looking kid, right? I mean, let's be honest. How many of you walk in? I, how many of you do this when you walk through and you see uh, in the little, you know, the little windows there when you're walking through in the hospital and you see all the babies that are born? How many of you ever walk through? And, oh, he's so cute. She's so cute. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. Has that happened to any of you? You know? Right? So you're looking for a good-looking kid. Hey, Amen, church? Let's be honest. Hey, you know what? Aren't you thankful that God's not like us? Hey, Amen, church? Aren't you thankful He's not like us? God takes us warts and all. He takes those that are not healthy. He takes the sick. He takes the poor. He takes the rich. He takes the ugly. He takes the uneducated. God accepts us. No matter how bad, how sorry, how no good, and even how good we think we are. Amen, church? God chooses us. That's what adoption is. And I want you to notice something this morning, that God predestined this. And that's a whole message in and of itself. 
But before time even existed, before the creation ever took place, God had already chosen you. He had already set the wheels in motion. He already knew what was going to happen, and He already knew that you were going to be His. Amen, church? Amen. God chose someone this morning that uh, I want to share with you some things about Him. I often hear from folks that say, Marty, there's no way that I can become a part of God's family because you just don't understand the condition of my life. Well, if you'll turn your Bible with me just for a moment to the book of Acts. And as I mentioned, we're going to do a lot of diving into God's Word this morning. Into the book of Acts, if you'll go with me there, please, to the 8th chapter. There was one, his name was Saul. Later he became Paul, but if you'll allow me this morning, let me talk to you about when his name was Saul. His name was Saul, and here was Saul, this... This uh, man who was a religious zealot, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a very educated man in the law of God, but yet he didn't know God. And here was Saul who decided that he was going to persecute the church, which is the church of Jesus Christ. He decided that uh, this, uh, this Jesus thing had to stop. And uh, I want you to notice that uh, Saul decided that what he was going to do was to do whatever he could to persecute the church. He was there when Stephen was out preaching the word of God. He held the, he held the coats and, uh, and the sweaters, so to speak, or the robes of all those that were standing there stoning Stephen, who was presenting the gospel. And he went on to say that I will persecute the church. He went out to gather up all the Christians that he could to have them persecuted, but yet Jesus chose Saul, who later became Paul. As Saul was walking with some of his the cohorts in crime, so to speak, on the Damascus Road, Jesus came down as a bolt of light came down and said, Saul, said these words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I can just imagine Saul, what? Say, who, what? What's going on? And many of you know the story. Jesus blinded Saul for three days, and he sat there in a room as he was taught. He later became one of the greatest missionaries, one of the greatest servants of Jesus Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I want you to notice something here, if you'll allow me. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. In verse number 9, Paul says this, For I am the least of the apostles. I am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Let me tell you something. If you've got an issue in your life, it could never be as bad as who Paul or Saul was. Because Saul was responsible for having Christians put to death. Is there anybody in here responsible for that this morning? I didn't think so. That's who Saul was. He was bad. But yet, on the Damascus Road, Jesus chose him and changed his life. And if Jesus can change the life of Saul, can he change your life? Yes, no, church. Yeah. <laughs> Saul was adopted into the kingdom of God. And as he was adopted into the kingdom of God, he went out and he began to preach and set up and establish churches all over the place. In fact, if you'll just bump up there on uh, chapter 15, I want you to notice what he says. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received, and which also you stand, by which you are saved. If you hold fast, first and foremost, understand that we are separated by sin. We're alienated. We're strangers to God. God wants each and every one of us to be saved. We have no hope without Jesus Christ. And the greatest part of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the adoption process. So let's this morning, if you'll allow me, with the time that we have, look at point number one. Adoption was initiated by God, which means God predestined this. He knew, he knew what's going to take place in creation. He knew that there would be sin. He knew that there was going to have to be a penalty for that sin. He knew that there would be a separation. He created you to love Him. He created you to worship Him. But He knew that in order for you to be a part of His kingdom, in order for you to be adopted, He was going to have to send His only Son, Jesus Christ. And by the way, I want to share this with you. God did not need you. Are you with me on that? In fact, Acts says that God has everything. He created you but for one purpose. He created you to love Him. 
and to worship him. And in order for you to love him and to worship him, he gave you a free will. Are you with me on that church? He didn't create a robot. He created you that you would love him and you would worship him. And when man sinned, he says, wait a minute. I love them so much, I'm going to send my son. In other words, I'm going to become man. I'm going to take on flesh. And I'm going to give of myself the ultimate sacrifice so that they can become part of my family. So number one, I want you to know this. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 6, it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, God predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. God had already set in motion a plan for your salvation. He had already set in motion, he had already prepared for you to accept him and to become part of the adoption process. Our adoption is unconditional. When you adopt a child, you don't ever give it back. You don't take it back. So this one threw up, I don't want it. This one poos, I don't care for this one. It's unconditional. This one's getting ugly. I just wasn't playing this way. This one's got a bent. It's not as disciplined as it should be. Let me tell you something. It is unconditional. And God accepted that in us. God says that I have sent my son Jesus Christ to be the payment to take care of your sins, both past, present, and future. Our salvation is not based on what we do. I want you to notice, church, it's based on what he did. You see, when you're adopted, it's not on what you did to be adopted. It's on what your parent did for what? For you. You see, God did all that. He planned all this. He set all of it in motion. Number two. Number two. Adoption was accomplished through Jesus Christ. Adoption was accomplished through God's Son, Jesus Christ. What one verse, if you were to share the gospel of Jesus Christ that is narrowed and put in one verse, what would it be? John 1, 3.16. If you'll say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Have eternal life, everlasting life. Now listen to that. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is God's predestined plan for you, all rolled up into one verse. It says, for God what? So loved the world. He loved his very creation, even though he knew his creation was what? It was sinful. He had given his creation a choice to love him or not to love him. And he says, I love you so much that I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ. I don't have to do this. I'm doing this because I what, church? I love you. Now think of that adoption process. When you adopt that child, you adopt that child, but for what reason, church? Not because you need someone to come home clean the house. Amen? Not because you need a status symbol to say, well, I just need a child. You adopt that child because you love that child. And you're willing to give what? Everything for that child. So for God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son that what? What's it say? That whosoever believeth in him. That's the simplicity of the gospel. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look with me in Galatians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. It says this. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wow, what church. I'll tell you what, if you haven't read those verses, you need to grasp into that. God, in fact, that's what Paul was trying to say there in Corinthians. Paul was trying to say, listen, you don't understand. Let me give you my short testimony. I was the chief of sinners. I was the worst of the worst, yet God chose me through his son, Jesus Christ. I accepted him. I accepted the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus. And Paul says, that's what I'm bringing to you. I'm bringing to you that God sent his son, and he gave himself for you. He was born of what? 
a woman. God in the flesh was born of a woman. And he died on the cross for you. And he was raised on that third day. Did you notice what Paul says? Many witnessed him alive. He was witnessed by his disciples. He was witnessed by 500 plus men. Some are asleep. Some have passed on. I too, Paul says, can share with you of the great glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus Christ and acceptance of him, the simplicity of the gospel, that we can be adopted. I just can't imagine. I can't imagine any child in any orphanage with a parent saying, hey, listen, we want you. We want you to be our son. We want you to be our daughter. I can't imagine that child turning around and saying, you know what? You got a pretty good in this orphanage here. <laughs> I get to share everything I have. I got nothing I can call my own. I have no inheritances. I have no rights. I have no privileges. I know you want to give me all that, but I just soon stay where I'm at. You see, that's what I don't understand. I don't understand why anybody would ever turn down the adoption into God's family. Why anybody would turn down the free gift that God has given us <clears throat> to become part of his kingdom, to be adopted into the family. And all we have to do is accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I can't understand why anybody would turn that down and turn that away. So we know that God initiated the adoption process. God had already planned it all out. He wanted us, and he wants us today. He sent his son to die for us. Through the, so the adoption process to be fulfilled, we have to what? We have to accept it. We have to accept that the payment has already been paid. We have to accept that Jesus Christ is our way to the kingdom of God. Amen, church? We have to accept it. We would never turn it down. We would never turn it away. But so many today have because it is just too simple. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, again, I want you to notice this. And it says, and he, that means God, made from every man and every nation of every mankind a living on the face of the earth. He made all of this, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their inhabitation. God created everything. There's nothing God doesn't know. There's nothing God can't do. God loves us. He wants us to be part of his family. It cost God everything. It cost God his son. I want you to gravitate to this one phrase. That in fact, I think I put it or had it put in the bulletin for you. If I did not, you want to write this down. I think this is so beautiful. Listen to this. It says, the Son of God became a man so that we could become sons and daughters of God. Or another way, let me put it this way. Jesus became what he never was before, a man. Without ceasing to be what he always was, and that's God. So that we could become what we never were before, and that's sons and daughters of God. And cease to be what we were, enslaved to sin and separated from God. That's a powerful church. God loved us so much that God himself became flesh gave of himself for you so that you could be a son and daughter in the kingdom of God. Philippians 5, excuse me, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Listen to this. It says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. For this reason also God highly exalted Jesus and bestowed in him the name which is above every name, church, so that at the name of Jesus, church, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to God the Father. Let me ask you this morning, before I go any farther, I just want you to search your heart and your soul this morning. Have you been adopted into the family of God? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I can't answer that for you. Ask yourself that question, that question this morning. Am I adopted into the family of God? Have I accepted the gift? Like Paul said, the simplicity of the gospel. 
have I confessed and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I was born into a sinful nature. I understand that. And Lord, I understand that that separates me from your family. But Lord, I also understand that you have provided for me a sacrifice. You have provided your son as payment, as ransom for my sin. And Lord, I accept that. And I confess my sin to you and I accept you. And I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior by paying the penalty on the cross for me. I believe that he rose and that I can serve a God that's alive today. I accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And God the Father, I want to be part of the family of God. So I come to you and ask you this question. Number one, first and foremost, I want you to know that God loves you. I love you. He loves you so much that he sent his son for you. That's part of the adoption process. But have you accepted that this morning? Only you know that. And number three, here we go. Last but not least. Number three. When we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Adoption is a present reality, and it's a future hope. Well, what does that mean? That means when you're adopted into the family of God, you get all the rights, you get all the privileges, and you get the inheritances that come with that. What does that mean? That means when I'm lying on a bed and, and I need the Lord to come and to give me strength, I have the privilege and the right to go to Him. I don't have to go to somebody and say, hey, listen, I need you to talk to God for me. Let me tell you something. As a child of the King, as a part of the family of God, I could go to Him and say, Lord, I'm one of yours. I'm one of your kids. And I need your help. And the Word of God says He will be our peace. He will be our comforter. He will be our strength. He will be our encourager. I can't imagine facing life without being a part of the family of God. How is it that Denise can sit back there and say, Hey, listen, I missed my family. That's a part of the family of God. How is it that Denise can sit back there and say, Thank you for praying for one of your own. Thank you for praying for one of your family members. We can go to God. I love what she said. She said she knew glory in Kim. In fact, I've seen some of the Facebook notes. Three o'clock morning, God gave me a, listen, I needed to get up and pray for you. Wow, that's powerful stuff. Isn't it amazing how God speaks to his children? Amen, church? You see, being a part of the family of God comes all these rights and all these privileges that those that are not part of the family don't have. Amen, church? And you know what? Not only do we have the rights and the privileges to talk to Him, converse with Him, to get His comfort, to get His encouragement, to get His strength, but let me tell you something. Should we face the valley of the shadow of death, I fear it not, for I have the inheritance of eternal life. Amen, church? That's what I have. You see, I don't understand why anybody, why anybody, We'll turn that down. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, he said, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. How many of you this morning have ever looked up and said, Yes, God, you are my Father. You're my Heavenly Father, and I can come to you. Paul says, you don't have to fall back in fear. Don't worry about this stuff anymore. You see, you've been adopted into the greatest kingdom of all, the kingdom of God. And he goes on, he said, the Spirit itself bears witness with your spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, Paul says, notice this in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 7, he says, and if we are the children of God, then we become heirs, heirs to God, and fellow heirs with Jesus Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified in him. Paul continued in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 24, it says this, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes and does not see? Let me, let me tell you something. Paul's saying, hey, listen, there is coming a day. Sometimes we're going to struggle on this earth. Amen, church? Sometimes we're going to have some bad days. Are you ready for this? This world is not your home. You're just passing through. Heaven has been prepared by God just for you because you're part of the family of God. So this morning, church, I ask you, 
Are you adopted into his family? Are you adopted into the family of God? I, um, I've got one other thing I want to share with you here, if you'll allow me just for a moment. Paul used a pretty strong verse in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Many of you may know this. It says, For the wages of sin is death. Are you with me, church? Hold on to that. For the wages of sin is death. When we were born, we were born into a sinful nature. And the wage for that sin penalty is the requirement of death. Not only a physical death, but a spiritual death. Paul didn't stop there. He says, For the wages of sin is death. And there's a but. I love the but. He says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ your Lord. Paul says, wait a minute. You don't have to stay in the orphanage. You don't have to have this sin death. All you have to do to be adopted is accept Jesus Christ. Accept the gift. And to have all of the rights and the privileges that come with it. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians this morning, if you'll turn there, I'm going to close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 and 6. I don't know if anybody's ever read this to you before. I don't know if you've ever studied this before. But I'm going to ask you to look at these two verses. I'm going to ask you to search your heart this morning. All right, listen to these verses. Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 13, verses 5 and 6. He says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Paul goes on and he says, But I trust that you will re realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. What's the test Paul is talking about? Paul says, Test yourself. Ask yourself right now if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Ask yourself right now if you're adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ. Test yourself, Paul says. So this morning, church, as I close this message about the first part of being a part of the family of God, and next week we're going to talk about all these inheritances and all the rights and all the privileges that come about being a part of the family of God, I want to ask you this morning, before I close this service, before we close this message, I want you to ask yourself if you have been adopted into the family of God. You see, God wants all of this for you. Why would anybody ever want to stay anywhere? Why would you want to be adopted into the family?